I know y'all are excited about today's tremendous uh, activities, uh, but uh, I wanted to welcome you to the first annual Senior Executives Association's Presidential Rank Awards Leadership Summit. My name is Bill Valdez, and I'm the president of the Senior Executives Association, and I wanted to welcome you to this event, uh, which really has uh, two goals. Uh, first, we're honoring the accomplishments of the 2016-2017 Presidential Rank Award winners. And if you're a Presidential Rank Award winner in 2016-17, raise your hand. Thank you. Congratulations. And if you have ever won a Presidential Rank Award in your career, raise your hand. As, as you will learn today, these career senior leaders have made the impossible look routine and the extraordinary seem normal. Second, our second goal is we hope to drive home a, message, a, a really simple message that career civil servants are delivering a tremendous return on investment to American taxpayers. Everyone who is or has been a career civil servant knows that you make decisions on a daily basis that impact the lives of every American taxpayer. Today, we also honor you and your accomplishments. So to every federal civil servant in the room, thank you for your service and thank you for what you've done. To, oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, would you please stand for the presentation of the colors? <laughs> Please be seated. And thank you to the Air Force Color Guard. Um, I, I think it's very appropriate that today, uh, Pearl Harbor Day, uh, that we acknowledge the service and, and sacrifice of the military, but also the career civil service. And later tonight, um, you'll have the opportunity to meet the longest serving federal employee in the history of our nation, 
75 years of civil service, who is still working hard for NAVC and uh, is a World War II veteran. So he has two distinctions. He's a, the only World War II veteran still in the civil service, and he's the longest serving civil servant in the United States history. Uh, so I think it's appropriate that we have Pearl Harbor Day today uh, because it really focuses on, you know, what it is that career civil servants bring to the nation. You know, to provide some context, let me read you a few numbers. And keep in mind that these accomplishments that I'm getting ready to give you uh, are just for the 36 2017 Pres Distinguished Rank Award honorees, 36 individuals. They managed an average agency budget of $12.8 billion. In total, they oversaw budgets totaling in excess of a half a trillion dollars. The average positive economic benefit per project headed by a Distinguished Rank Award winner in 2017 was $9.16 billion and the average distinguished honoree is individually responsible for nearly a half a billion dollars in savings to the federal government taxpayers. Total budgetary cost savings secured through the leadership of 2017 Distinguished Rank Award honorees alone is over $650 billion. These are amazing accomplishments. You can go to Senior Executive Association's website and read the full accomplishments for all of the 2016 and 2017 winners. You'll be astounded. The awardees we recognize today and with whom you will be mingling as the day progresses include at least two Nobel Prize winners, scientists who have revolutionized their respective fields and indeed created new ones, career leaders who have made decisions impacting huge swaths of the economy, and heroic members of the federal law enforcement community who are leading the international effort to combat trafficking and global terrorism. These presidential rank award winner honorees represent every possible facet of leadership. Leadership within complex agencies, leadership in the community, leadership in times of crisis, and leadership dedicated to confronting every single challenge facing our nation and international community. This is the impact of career leadership, and it's what we at the Senior Executives Association mean when we discuss the importance of, outs, of cultivating leaders and the importance of a relentless focus on public service excellence, which is the theme of today's conference. A year ago, the Senior Executives Association set out to reinvent itself. The end result was an inversion of mission. This was an intentional decision to move SEA from a role as the voice of the Senior Executive Service to a role in which the SES is the voice of career senior leaders. Because there is no better argument for why career federal leadership is necessary than to simply highlight what career federal leadership can, ac can achieve when given room to succeed. SEA is ultimately driven by an aspirational goal, restoring the nobility of public service. Perhaps no president is more associated with the civil service than President John F. Kennedy, who in one speech in Congress said, the success of government and thus the success of our nation depends in the last analysis upon the quality of our career services. The legislation enacted by Congress, as well as decisions made by me and the department and agency heads, must all be, all be implemented by the career men and women in the federal service. In foreign affairs, national defense, science and technology, and a host of other fields, they face problems of unprecedented unprecedented importance. We are all dependent on their sense of loyalty and responsibility, as well as their comp competence and energy. The 2016-2017 Presidential Rank Award winners have every right to lay claim to this uh, legacy, but they are just the tip of the spear when it comes to public service accomplishments. Everyone in this room is living up to the ideals expressed by President Kennedy and demonstrating to the American people that a career in federal service is a noble undertaking. 
These are the ideals we had in mind when we drafted the Senior Executives Association's new strategic direction, the set of guiding principles by which we operate. It's a vision of federal service that is proud, passionate, and noble. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for your dedication to public service, but I can't say it better than President Kennedy, who in his very first State of the Union address said, let the public service be a proud and lively career, and let every man and woman who works in any area of our national government, in any branch, at any level, be able to say with pride and with honor in future years, I served the United States in that hour of our nation's need. Again, thank you for your service, and thank you for being here today as we move forward. Um, now I'd like to introduce uh, Anthony Bardinelli uh, from Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you, Bill. And good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing this morning? Excellent. Our opening keynote, Linda McMahon, serves as a 25th administrator of the Small Business Administration. As a member of the President's Cabinet, she advocates on behalf of the 30 million small businesses in America. She leads a team of professionals dedicated to ensuring entrepreneurs have the support and tools they need to start, grow, and succeed in business. Significantly through access to the capital and federal contracting opportunities, counseling and mentorship, and financial assistance following declared disasters. As an entrepreneur and business executive herself, Ms. McMahon is the founder and federal CEO of WWE. Growing WWE from a 13-person regional operation to a publicly traded global enterprise with more than 800 employees in offices worldwide. She has been a longtime advocate for women in leadership and businesses and widely recognized as one of the country's top female executives. Please welcome Ms. Linda McMahon. just realized that I was mic'd and I didn't need to have this towering mic over here. Good morning, everyone. Anthony, thank you very much. I very much appreciate being invited to speak here this morning. And, and welcome to what I'm sure will be an insightful and engaging day of leadership development. You are here because you've already exhibited outstanding leadership in your agencies. And you are showing you are ready for even more. I truly believe that leadership is not something where you can simply check the box and move on. It's something you must develop and exercise daily. It's like a muscle. If you don't use it, it'll atrophy. When you do use it, it grows. You'll feel it and other people will notice it. You have to exercise it so it will be strong enough to handle the bigger challenges that are likely to follow. You can't always predict what those challenges will be, <clears throat> but you have to be sure your leadership muscle is really well conditioned and ready for what's next. I experienced that lesson just months ago into my leadership of the SBA. Before I was tapped to be administrator, I didn't even know that the SBA managed disaster assistance. I always associated disasters with FEMA, who do an awful, awfully good job. But in fact, the SBA has a very big role. When an area gets a disaster declaration for hurricanes, earthquakes, or what have you, the SBA provides low interest loans to businesses of all sizes, as well as to nonprofit organizations, homeowners, and renters. The SBA works very closely with FEMA and other federal agencies, as well as with our partners at the state and local levels to help make sure recoveries happen as expeditiously as possible. 
I was able to travel with uh, President Trump after Hurricane Harvey down to Houston, and again with him to Puerto Rico. And it's uh, an incredible heartwarming and heart-tugging situation to be in when you see how the members of leadership come together to make sure that these recoveries can happen as quickly as possible. So when I came on board at SBA, I was committed to learning everything I could about our disaster response capacity. As a matter of fact, during my Senate confirmation hearing, one of the questions I was asked was, what, what is the most daunting thing that you think you might face as SBA director? And I said, it is the helping disaster victims recover because you never know when a disaster is going to hit. It can happen as we're sitting here in this hearing room. You never know when it's going to happen, when it's going to come, or <laughs> I knew that I wasn't going to be given a honeymoon period or that no one was going to forgive my flaws on a learning curve when people are without power and food and water and not able to get back into their homes. I knew my leadership of the SBA would be judged on our ability to respond. I asked our head of disaster assistance, James Rivera, what was the biggest disaster the agency had ever responded to, and he said Hurricane Katrina in 2005. I asked him, so what would happen if we had three Hurricane Tr Katrinas all in a row? Would we be ready? I wasn't willing to accept a no answer. How would we make sure we were ready for that? Now my leadership style is, is pretty simple. Set the vision for what you want to achieve. Build a team of talented people who are smarter than you are for what you need them to do. Communicate what's expected, but in the end, hold them accountable. And that philosophy of management and leadership style has worked for me when I was a CEO in the private sector for both uh, WWE and then another company I founded called Women's Leadership Live. And I always, when I interviewed executives who were coming in uh, for different roles, especially at WWE, when I interviewed them, and they were always senior executives at, at that level, I said, look, I need you to be smarter than I am. I need you to know more than I know about this, or I don't need you to be here. So I worked with James to make sure we were ready for whatever might come. He's a veteran of the SBA, 28 years this month, all but six of them working in disaster assistance. In fact, James was recognized in 2011 as a distinguished executive in SES, a recognition I understand some of you are receiving here today. So I know he was a lot smarter than I was about the resources that needed to be in place, what could be planned ahead of time, and for things we couldn't anticipate, how could we best mobilize in the midst and the aftermath of a disaster? During our briefing, James told me the SBA had just done a pretty thorough exercise with his team working out how they would handle a disaster with 100,000 loan applications. They had a staffing model to strategize how many people we would need in the call center, how many loan processors, how many attorneys. During Superstorm Sandy in 2012, they did 85,500 loan applications. So they were looking at a Sandy-sized disaster, going from the current 800 employees up to 2,500 employees to manage the surge in demand which might come. As so I said to James, well, okay, that's good, but I don't think you're really stretching yourself enough. You're just kind of slightly pushing ahead a model you've worked with before. Hurricanes Katrina, Rita, and Wilma in 2005 had 400,000 SBA loan applications worth about $11 billion. So I asked him, I said, so tell me, James, what would happen if we were struck three times in a row, one right behind the other with Katrina-sized or Sandy-sized storms? And he said, well, we'd be in trouble. And I said, well, trouble's not an option. So James and his team got back together and exercised a response strategy for 1.2 million loan applications instead of the 400,000 that we'd had in 2005. 
That exercise enabled us to get our heads around hiring as many as 8,000 employees. We have 1,000 core employees and 2,000 reservists. How would we get through a surge that would be needed? Where would we put them? And how could we use technology to enable teleworking? And guess what? This summer we got hit with three significant disasters in a row, Hurricane Harvey, Irma, and Maria. Three massive disasters in three different areas, each with horrific floods. Damage to homes, businesses, and infrastructure. Anticipating the challenges that might happen had put us in a better position to respond effectively when they actually did happen. Here's how. In the few months since Harvey, we added almost 4,000 employees. We had interagency agreements, so we were able to utilize people who were already federal employees, <clears throat> who already had background checks and PIV cards. And PIV cards, I'm sure you all know what they are. They allow us to get into our agencies and log into our computers. And they were immediately available to mobilize. Was it perfect? No. We learned some lessons. For example, we could have had five interagency agreements at the cabinet level rather than 25 at the bureau level to have amassed those folks that we needed quick, in, a, in a quicker fashion. But the ability to stack up quickly enabled us to get help to the people who needed it more expeditiously. As a result, the SBA did a billion dollars in loans in the first 45 days after the first storm. By comparison, it took 90 days to reach a billion dollars relative to Sandy. So we cut our time in half. We've done almost three times the amount of work we did in Sandy, obviously in half the time. That would not have been possible if we had not challenged ourselves to anticipate the need to hire thousands of people so quickly. We had a team working to figure out how to be successful. I held James and our entire disaster assistance team accountable for making sure what needed to get done was getting done. <laughs> it was painful. I can tell you, we had some painful days. But we met every single day, and we provided reports to the Hill on how many applications we received, how many we were processing, the dollar amount of the loans, the staff we had on the ground. Where are the choke points? What's working? What's not? We're still doing that three months since the hurricanes. Some were reluctant to be that transparent to Congress, but in hindsight, it's probably the best thing we did. The Hill was willing to work with us. They understood our requests for appropriations because we'd been so transparent about how the loans were being approved, giving daily reports instead of the monthly reports that are required by law. And we continue to evaluate and learn what's working, what isn't, and what can we do better next time. Again, I think this experience shows my own leadership strategy. Set a vision, build a good team, communicate what's expected, and hold them accountable. It's a pretty simple strategy. But so far, I have found that it's been very effective, whether I was leading a federal agency, a startup, or a publicly traded international company. Throughout today's summit, I encourage you to think about your own strategies for leadership. How are you exercising your leadership muscle and conditioning it for the bigger challenges ahead? How are you using your experience in the past to anticipate what may lurk out there in the future? How are you working to motivate the teams that you manage? I believe in leadership by example. It's a commitment that my husband and I shared as we built our company, starting with our very first employee to when we built it into a global enterprise with over 800 employees all over the world. Leadership is not about a fancy title or a corner office, but it is about respect especially for the people you lead. One example, we had a tradition at WWE that all of our performing talent stayed for all of the matches even after their particular match was over. Nothing was as rewarding to our performers as when they came out of the ring 
to the backstage area to find their fellow performers applauding for them and their performance. There might have been 20,000 fans cheering in the arena, but respect from their peers was the highest accolade they could achieve. And that respect was not just expected of our performers. Everyone connected to WWE had the same job description. Put smiles on people's faces. Whether you were working in the ring or backstage, in a cubicle or in the C-suite, your job was to make sure that the fans, our WWE consumers, had had an enjoyable experience with our WWE product. And that's the same message and philosophy I have at SBA. Our consumers are the potential entrepreneurs who are starting or continuing their businesses. And how they interact with our products, what their satisfaction level is, is what we must make sure we keep at the highest levels. What about the people you manage? Do they know what mission they are working to achieve? How have you communicated what's expected to them? How do you hold them accountable? How do you, how do you give them every day that leadership that they are expecting to keep them on the right path? This matters. Not just doing the big capital L leadership moments like responding to a hurricane. It's but the way you show leadership even when you think no one is watching. Believe me, people are watching. You don't see them. You don't know that they're there. I'll give you an example. As a CEO, respect for others meant I never expected anyone to do anything I was not willing to do myself. And that's my philosophy today. That applied to the big things. And it applied to the little things. I remember one time I was walking down the hallway, uh, you know, up on the executive level, and I stopped to pick up some trash that had fallen onto the floor. Not a big deal, right? Well, there were some people who saw me do that. And, and they were shocked to see that I stopped to pick up the trash. After all, I was a CEO. But if a job needed to be done, nothing was beneath me. <laughs> and I, I dare to say that no one ever again walked past a piece of trash on the floor. They didn't pick it up and put it in the trash can. I'm working to make sure that as administrator of the SBA, I know that everyone on my team feels respected and I do not expect them to do anything that I would not be willing to do myself. After all, every single one of us is working towards the same goal, helping our nation's small businesses start, grow, and succeed. Whether they work in headquarters here in Washington, in one of our 68 district offices around the country, or in a response center set up in the aftermath of a disaster, I want everyone pulling the wagon in the same direction and they need to know what direction that is. Throughout today's summit, I challenge you to think about how you express your leadership, not just in the big things, but also in your approach to the little things. Lead by example, ask questions, anticipate problems, show that you care about people, I've found that the best way to build a team is to have a genuine interest in what your team is doing. Find what inspires them and motivates them to do what they do. I try to take some time, I can't do it every week, but I'll try to take time when there's a little break in my schedule to walk around the floors at SBA. And we have about eight floors, we have almost 2,000 people in agency headquarters, and I'll just kind of pop through you know, one division and say hi scare the heck out of people sometimes. <laughs> they, oh, wow, and they jump up, you know, and I, I say, well, fine, cool, I just wanted to stop by and say hello. And so it just it gives a little energy sometimes for them to know that, that you really care. That care and attention you give will come back and your entire agencies and our entire federal workforce will be so much better for it. So I'll just leave you today by saying that I am thoroughly enjoying my job at SBA. I'm learning about government. I came from the private sector. Sometimes I'm frustrated by it. But then when I look at the folks that were like referenced before, the longest serving member in federal government, 
all of our SESs, I have such incredible respect for the commitment and the devotion that you have for public service. So be our leaders, continue to be our leaders because you already are. And I thank you for letting me have a moment to say hello this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Administrator McMahon. Um, when we were searching for a keynote speaker uh, for this event, uh, the first opening keynote speaker, um, Elias Hernandez, you know, raised his hand and said, oh, I've got the perfect one. Uh, he's the Chico for SBA. And he said, you can't believe what a job uh, Administrator McMahon has been doing in the transition and in welcoming the career senior executives and the career civil service to be part of her team at uh, SBA. And after hearing these remarks, I think uh, in future transitions, we're going to have you come back and you know, educate, you know, future uh, high-level political appointees about how to do it right. Again, that was an amazing uh, speech. Thank you so much. Thank you again. I, I retired in 2014, but I think I'm going to go back to the SBA. Um, so, <laughs> so um, uh, unfortunately, uh, Kathleen McGettigan, who is the uh, acting administrator at OPM was not able to join us this morning, but she did want to send some remarks, uh, so please uh, cue the video. Hello, I'm Kathy McGettigan, acting director of the U.S. Office of Personnel Management. Thank you all for being here and for your service within the federal government. I am humbled and honored to have the privilege of speaking to you. I'm sorry I was unable to be there with you, but I felt that I still had several things I wanted to say. As recipients of the Presidential Rank Award, you have proven to your cabinet secretary or agency head that you possess the qualities of an individual who wholeheartedly embraces new challenges and opportunities, who inspires your colleagues, and who motivates those who work for you to reach their highest potential. You have chosen to use your gift of leadership, skill set, and many talents to further benefit the advancement of the federal government and in the even bigger picture, for the advancement of the United States of America. As members of the Senior Executive Service, senior level and scientific technical employees, your core qualifications have met the standards of a board convened by OPM. You represent the very best in public service, positive change and commitment to accomplishing the mission of the federal government. Our mission at OPM is to find the very best talent to bring into federal service and develop toward future leadership positions. Throughout the duration of your career, you have become that talent, and OPM is proud to have even the slightest role in your many successes. Look around the room. You and those who surround you are individuals who have exemplified a relentless commitment to the very highest ideals of public service. These are people who have made enormous accomplishments to our society. People who have led initiatives to reduce the amount of fatal crashes involving large trucks and buses across our nation's highways. People who have established overseas laboratories for Ebola virus detection and diagnosis during the epidemic to save lives. Individuals who have designed and led two of the largest field experiments in the history of NASA, who have discovered ways to significantly reduce disaster response times, and many, many, many more accomplishments. Similarly to the characteristics you also have, with unbridled courage, zeal, and tenacity, Theodore Roosevelt worked to ensure a hiring system for America's government workers based on fairness and equal access and protection for all, making him the undisputed father of today's federal service. At OPM, 
We often invoke his name due to his many achievements that helped establish federal service into the system it is today, which is why I would like to leave you with a quote I have found during my service to be true. Theodore Roosevelt said, far and away, the best prize that life has to offer is the chance to work hard at work worth doing. Your work and achievements are improving the lives of the American citizenry, and that's something I know you can sleep soundly over. Thank you for your determination, and congratulations on your many accomplishments, and please enjoy the rest of your summer, because you certainly deserve it. So during today's summit, you're going to be learning directly from uh, Presidential Rank Award winners during our different concurrent sessions. Uh, and later today, we'll be honoring uh, the meritorious uh, winners at a lunchtime uh, ceremony in this room. And then in the evening, we'll be re recognizing the Distinguished Rank Award winners. Um, you have your agenda, uh, and the concurrent sessions are upstairs, uh, and I encourage you to attend them. We also have uh, three different training sessions led by Arbinger, Deloitte, and uh, the American University Key Leadership Program, and encourage you to attend those as well. Uh, but before doing that, uh, this kind of event does not happen without a lot of help. And we get a lot of help from our corporate sponsors and friends. Uh, and so I'd like to acknowledge them today. Um, our gold sponsors are Deloitte, BGRS, Blue Cross Blue Shield, the Federal Long-Term Care Insurance Program, and you'll see them out in the exhibit hall later on. Our uh, thanks to our platinum sponsor, Management Concepts, our meritorious and distinguished rank award sponsor, Microsoft, our lanyard sponsor, GEICO, and our exclusive media sponsor, Government Executive Media Group, which is live taping this, uh, at least portions of this event. Um, please give them all a round of applause during the course of the day. I'd like to... I'd like to encourage you to visit them, uh, have a conversation with them, because they also are doing extraordinary work on behalf of our nation and in cooperation with our uh, uh, different agencies. Now, let me send you on your way with one final thought. Uh, everyone in this room, sponsors, feds, non-feds, should be congratulated for their contributions to public service excellence. Please give yourselves a round of applause for a job well done in the service of your country.